Hi, and welcome to this webinar on understanding Islam and Muslims. My name is Wali Rahman. I'm an organizational development consultant for inclusion and diversity at Wiltshire Council. And in this workshop or webinar, we will cover the following subjects and topics. Muslim beliefs, the concept of God in Islam, the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islamic history, Muslim culture and identity, the five pillars of Islam, dealing with Muslims in the workplace, women in Islam, Islamophobia, and preventing extremism and terrorism. So this is a very brief overview and whistle stop tour of a major world religion, which is followed by 1.8 billion people all over the world. So I don't claim to represent all of those people and nor are they a homogenous group. The beliefs, customs, cultures, practices, commitment and observance will vary from country to country, group to group and individual to individual. So this is mainly an overview of mainstream Sunni Islam as I understand it. Just to begin with, I want to give you a brief introduction and overview of Islam. And the word Islam, what does it mean? So Islam is an Arabic word which means peace and submission to the will of Allah, which is the Arabic name for Almighty God. And whoever does this, i.e. whoever submits to the will of God, is called a Muslim. Now, Islam has two main sources from which we take our teachings. The first one is the Quran, which is the book, the divine book and scripture of the Muslims. And Muslims regard the Quran as the verbatim word of God and a revelation from God. The second source of Islamic teachings come from the hadith and sunnah, the Arabic words, which basically are the teachings, the sayings, and the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, it's very important to distinguish the two. So the Quran, as I mentioned, we believe to be the word of God, and the hadith and the sunnah, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, they are his words inspired by God. And when it comes to the authenticity, we have Islamic scholars over the last 1400 years have classified those sayings of Prophet Muhammad into different categories from the strongest authentic down to weak and fabricated as well. And they do this as a very exact science when it comes to verifying those sayings. Um, and we're very fortunate that we have those categorizations and classifications in the books. With regards to the Quran, we believe that everything in the Quran is authentic and from God. And it goes through the same rigorous verification processes with a chain of narration. Um, so it would be from God to Angel Gabriel, and then Angel Gabriel recited those words of the Quran to Prophet Muhammad, who then repeated them to his followers and companions, and multiple of them at a time would um, commit these to memory and to paper, and eventually they would well, eventually, by the time the Prophet Muhammad died, he had been given divine instruction as to how those verses revealed over 23 years fit in together. And then the Quran as a book was then compiled.
Now, I mentioned at the start that there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. 85% of them are Sunni Muslims. That's around 1.6 billion people. And 15% are Shia Muslims. Now, the main differences between the Sunni and Shia are to do with initially in, in the early days to do with political differences. So fundamentally, the beliefs, the core beliefs are the same, but there originally were some differences due to uh, politics and this resulted in some conflict between the early Muslims and resulted in the splitting of the two different groups. In brief, the Sunni Muslim community, the majority, as I mentioned, they believed that the rulership of the Muslims after the death of Prophet Muhammad would go initially to those who he appointed, his closest companions, and then it would be upon merit. However, the Shia Muslims, they believed that the leadership and the rulership should always stay in the bloodline of Prophet Muhammad and his family. So those were the original main differences. Now, with Muslims being 1.8 billion across the globe, that equates to around a quarter of the world's population. So that's why it's important to learn a little bit about Muslims and their history and culture and practices and beliefs. Just like it is for, for us to know about any other group of people. Now Islam, as I mentioned, um, out of those 1.8 billion Muslims, only around 20% are Arabs. And it's a very common misconception that all Muslims are Arabs, but this is not the case. So the, um, the most, the highest population of Muslims is actually in Indonesia. And there are over 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. And Muslims in Indonesia primarily accepted the religion through trade with Muslim Arabs in the um, early days of Islam. And contrary to, again, popular belief that Islam was spread by the sword, this is not the case at all. And we'll discuss that a bit later on. So Islam has had a profound global impact since it was founded in the seventh century during what is known as the golden age of Islam, which lasted roughly between the mid eighth century until the 13th century, the Muslim world was a center of intellectual activity with Baghdad serving as the capital for philosophers, mathematicians, and scientists. Mathematics, language, astronomy, and medicine were particularly influenced by this culture and its effects can still be seen to this day. I want to now present to you some basic principles that Muslims believe in, just to give you an idea and then we'll look at some values as well. So the basic principles that I've listed here, um, I've just noted from the top of my head, but these are principles that I believe that all Muslims believe in. So we believe that every human being is born pre-formatted to believe in and submit to God alone. What that means is that Deep down, this our belief that everybody believes in God, whether they acknowledge it or admit to it or not. And an example of this is when people are in immense difficulty or life-threatening situations, the first thing they'll usually do, for example, if they're in a plane that's about to go down, the first thing they might do is pray and call out to God, oh God, help me. 
and so on. And there's a very famous um, quote from Winston Churchill, and he's quoted to have said, there are no atheists on the battlefield. The next thing I have here is the fact that Muslims believe that human beings have a free will. And that means that God doesn't force us to do anything. We're responsible for our own actions and we will be accountable for our actions. We also believe that there is no compulsion in religion. And just going back to what I said earlier about Islam not being spread by the sword, this principle is a fundamental principle of Islam that no one can force another person to accept Islam or any other faith for that matter. Everybody has the freedom of religion. And there's a verse in the Quran in the second chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah, which says, the translation of which is, let there be no compulsion in religion. We also believe that people are born pure and without any inherited sin. And this is um, one of the differences between Islam and Christianity. One of the similarities of, and there are many similarities between Islam, Christianity and Judaism is that we believe that all human beings belong to one race and that we are all from Adam and Eve. And what this means is Muslims are not allowed to judge people based on the color of their skin, their nationality, their wealth, um, their status, and so on. We are taught only to judge people by the content of their character. So who do Muslims worship then? I mentioned the word Allah at the beginning, and I mentioned this is the Arabic name for God. So it is our belief as Muslims that there is one God for all of humanity. And we believe that the God we worship, Allah is the same God worshiped by Christians and Jews. In fact, Allah, the word Allah is an Arabic word, which is also used by Christians and Jews who speak Arabic. And you can, tr you can try this if you have any friends who are from the Middle East, um, who speak Arabic, but who are Christian, just ask them what, how they refer to God in their language. And they will tell you that they use the same word, Allah. And Allah comes from the Arabic word ilah, which means a God or something worshiped. So ilah is a God in the general sense, but Allah is, means the God, the only God worthy of worship. And this word Allah in Arabic, it can't be, you can't assign a gender to it. So it's neither male nor female. Unlike the English word God, if you put an ESS, it becomes feminine, goddess. You can put an S on the end to make it plural. However, the Arabic word Allah is always singular and it's never plural. And it literally means the only one to be worshiped. And we believe that God is self-sufficient. He has no parents, no children is ever living, is loving, the most loving, the most generous, the most exalted, and so on. In fact, we believe, it, one of our branches of theology is the belief in God's names and attributes. And this is one way of us understanding the nature of God. You see, in Islam, we're not allowed to draw images of God because nobody has seen him. So we don't know who, what God looks like. And you'll find in history, some religions, 
when people start drawing images of their idea of God, usually it's used by the majority group to suppress um, another group, unfortunately, because everybody will always draw image of God in their own likeness. And we as Muslims, for us, it's blasphemous to give God the attributes of human beings or any creature and the vice, um, vice versa. So we're also not allowed to give man the attributes of God. So who was Muhammad? Peace be upon him. So Muslims don't worship Muhammad. We believe that he was a man, but he was also a messenger chosen by God to deliver God's message to humanity. He was born in the year 570 of the Christian calendar, almost 600 years after Jesus Christ. And he was born in the city of Mecca, which is in present day Saudi Arabia. Of course, in those days, there was no such country as Saudi Arabia, but that's only uh, in recent times that the countries have been formed. But back then it was all Arabia. His name, Muhammad, it means the praised one or praising one. His father died before he was born and his mother died when he was just six. So initially his grandfather looked after him and then his uncle uh, took care of him. His nickname was Al-Amin, the trustworthy. And this was his nickname all his life, even before he became a prophet. So we believe that he became a prophet at the age of 40. But even before that, everybody knew him as Al-Amin, the trustworthy, because his people, the people of Mecca, they said he was known to never tell a lie. He had several jobs, just as anyone in those times would have. And also like the prophets in the Bible, he was a shepherd, um, then he became a trader and a businessman. And he worked for a wealthy widow um, called Khadija. And when he was 25 years old, he married Khadija and together they had a blissful married life until she passed away much later on. And they had four daughters and two sons. Sadly, his sons died in infancy. At the age of 40, Prophet Muhammad received prophethood. So one night he was meditating on the outskirts of Mecca on, uh, on the mountaintop in a cave. And it was there in that cave that he received a visit from the Archangel Gabriel. Yes, the same Gabriel that's mentioned in the Bible. From that moment, so Gabriel brought to him the first verses of the Quran. And from that time, and for the next 23 years, Gabriel would keep visiting Muhammad with verses of the Quran from God. And this would last for the next 23 years up until the death of the Prophet Muhammad. And these verses were revealed to coincide with incidents in the life of Prophet Muhammad over those next 23 years. So every verse has a history and a context. Once Muhammad became a prophet, he started to preach to his people soon after, and he was met with a lot of hostility, enmity and hatred, so much so that his followers were tortured, killed, threatened, and eventually he had to leave the place of his birth and his home city of Mecca, and he migrated with his followers to Medina. So this was after 13 years 
of enduring such hardship. And then the last 10 years of his life, he would spend in Medina, where the city um, that took the Muslims in and they accepted Islam. And two years before his death, Muhammad would go back to Mecca and conquer Mecca with his followers and they all surrendered. So it was a conquest, but without any fighting or bloodshed. And, but he ended up going back to Medina because that's where he had made his home. And he died uh, soon after that. So the legacy of Muhammad is such a unique and powerful legacy. And it's a shame that he's really misunderstood um, these days. But here I've, I've just shared some tweets from a campaign on Twitter a couple of years ago, just to show what Muhammad means to Muslims. So this is referring to an incident where Prophet Muhammad was invited to deliver the message of Islam to a village outside of Mecca. And the people, they tricked him. They asked him to come. And then when he turned up, they sent some louts and ruffians to pelt him with stones until he had to flee and he was bloodied from head to toe. And instead of being angry with them, he just turned to God and he prayed for their forgiveness. And it, later on, actually, they became, that whole village became Muslim eventually. And they were actually some of the, um, the most ardent followers of Muhammad and his helpers. This one says, who is Muhammad? Peace be upon him. A man so trustworthy, his own enemies left their belongings with him for safekeeping when they used to go away. And this is referring to the fact that even though the people of Mecca, the, um, the chieftains and the leaders, they opposed him for the message that he brought because he told them that they should worship one God, but they had over 360 idols that they worshiped along with God. And even though they killed his followers, tortured them, and they fought him, they still believed that he was Alameen, the trustworthy. So they would leave all of their belongings with him because obviously in those days there were no banks. So they had to find the most trustworthy place to keep their belongings. And for them in that city, it was the house of Prophet Muhammad. This one said, who is Muhammad? A woman used to throw trash at him when he passed by her house. He went to visit her when she got ill. So this is referring to a story, a true story, where he used to walk past the house of an elderly lady and she was opposed to his message and she disliked him. So she would throw her rubbish out from her first floor window and as he walked past, and one day he noticed that, you know, there was nothing there as he walked past. So instead of being relieved and happy, he actually knocked on the door because he was worried. Is she okay? Maybe she's sick. And he actually found out that she was indeed sick. He visited her, asked her if she needed anything. And she was so touched by this and shocked in the fact that, you know, why, you know, is he being so nice to me when I treat him in this way? And that was just his character. And there are many historians and academics who are non-Muslim who have studied the life of Prophet Muhammad and written books on him from an academic and objective point of view. And they have concluded, um, many of them, that he was a good person and more than that, in fact. So this is a quote from George Bernard Shaw, who says that if anyone would be a, a righteous dictator for the world, it would have to be Muhammad. So that's a pretty bold statement. 
We also find there's a book called The 100 Most Influential People in History, written by Michael H. Hart. And in that book, he places Jesus, and he himself is a Christian, and he places Jesus as number three, and he places Muhammad as number one, due to what he accomplished um, and his achievement in all aspects of his mission and his life. Looking now at some Islamic values, Muslims believe in God consciousness and prayer. We believe in love for parents and family uh, relationships, keeping the ties of kinship. We also believe in being good to our neighbors, serving the community, charity, feeding the poor, um, and needy. We believe in striving for equality and justice. We believe in tolerance for all people. We believe in good manners and modesty. We believe in speaking the truth. And Prophet Muhammad said to speak the truth even if it's against your own self. And we believe in obeying the law. So no matter where a Muslim lives, they are bound by the law of that country and they are not allowed by Islamic law. They're not allowed to break the law of any country that they're living in, whether it's a secular country or a religious country. And this was mentioned in an article a few years back by the former Archbishop of Canterbury, who said that Islam is reviving British values. And that's a man of religion, of the church, and he knows what he's talking about. So now I'm going to talk about the six pillars of faith. So there are two separate things here. There's the six pillars of faith, six articles of faith, which Muslims believe in. Then there are five pillars of Islam, which are the five pillars of practice. So you may have heard of the five pillars, and that's something separate and we'll come on to. But first of all, I want to talk about the six pillars of faith. So every Muslim believes in God. And we talked about that and the fact that the name for God in Arabic is Allah. We believe in angels. These are creatures who we believe just like Christians and Jews believe. They are in the realm of the unseen but we don't see them, but we believe in them and they carry out God's commands. And the archangel in our religion is the same angel Gabriel. We believe in divine books. So we believe that God sent down books throughout history to guide people. So as Muslims, we believe in the Psalms of David the Torah of Moses, the gospel of Jesus, and so on. But we believe that those books were not preserved in their entirety, and God had to send down a final book, and that is the Quran, according to our belief. We believe in prophets and messengers. So we believe in all of the prophets that were mentioned in the Bible and the Torah. So we believe in Adam as the first man and first prophet, in Noah, in Abraham, in Moses, in David, Solomon, Jesus, and his cousin, John the Baptist. So one of the main differences between Islam and Christianity is to do with the belief with regards to the divinity of Jesus. So Muslims believe that Jesus was a mighty messenger of God. He was born to the Virgin Mary through miraculous means. However, we, we don't believe that Jesus was the son of God, nor do we believe that Jesus was crucified. 
and this might shock a lot of people, but Muslims actually believe. We believe in the story of the crucifixion, but we believe that it wasn't Jesus who was crucified. We believe that Jesus was saved by God from the cross and his likeness was put onto another individual. Some Muslim scholars have said this could be Judas as a punishment for his betrayal, or it could be one of his followers as, um, as a show of commitment and sacrifice for the love of Jesus. And Jesus himself was taken by God in our beliefs, and this is mentioned in the Quran, and he is still alive to this day, and we believe that he will come back in the future. We also believe in the day of judgment and the afterlife, and that eventually everyone will be judged and they will be punished or rewarded. So we believe in the concept of heaven and hell, just like Christianity and Judaism. We also believe in divine destiny, and that's the sixth pillar of faith. And this basically just means that God is in control of everything. Um, so we believe in his decree and predestination. So again, this doesn't mean that we are not responsible for our actions, but we've been given within that broad um, divine destiny, we've been given freedom and we will be judged according to our own actions. And it also means that God knows everything that has happened and will happen and so on. Now, the five pillars of Islam are slightly different and these are the pillars of practice for Muslims. So the first one is faith or testimony of faith. And this is to declare and to believe in a statement which is that there is no deity worthy of worship except for God, Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. The second pillar of Islam is ritual prayer five times a day, every day. And these prayers are performed in a methodical way at set times throughout the day, starting from before the sun rises in the morning up until late evening before we go to sleep. And each of those prayers requires us to be clean and pure. We wash ourselves. Um, we make what's called ablution. And then we just need a clean and quiet space to pray. And if we're praying at home, it will take five minutes just to do the minimum compulsory aspect of the prayer. We're encouraged to pray in the mosque in congregation. Um, however, if people are too busy at school or work, then they can pray wherever they are. And on Friday is the congregational day of worship for Muslims. And it's actually compulsory on all male Muslims to go to the mosque on Friday. It's optional for women. Um, if they want to go, they can. But men, they have to um, do their best to attend the mosque on Friday and uh, pray during that time. And it's usually around lunchtime in most places. The third pillar of Islam is zakat, which is a form of charity, although it could be regarded as a compulsory tax on the rich. So charity in general can be given at any time by anyone. 
However, the, the charity we're talking about, the zakat, is a compulsory charity on those people who can afford to pay that. And there is a threshold amount which is calculated by the price of gold at any given time um, or at the time that a person has to give that zakat. So basically, over a period of 12 months, if a Muslim has above the threshold, which I believe at the moment is around 3,000 pounds. So if they've maintained above that level for a whole year, then at the end of that year, they have to give 2.5% to eight categories of the poor and needy, or one of eight categories. If they go under that threshold, so say that you know they had 3,000 pounds and then they had a major expense, um, they went below that before the 12 months was up, then that wouldn't be mandatory for them, that zakat. The fourth pillar of Islam is fasting in the month of Ramadan. Now, Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. And the Islamic lunar calendar is around 11 days shorter than the Gregorian calendar. What that means is, while the Gregorian calendar stays fixed, the Islamic calendar goes around it and it, it comes 11 days earlier every year. Um, so for example, this year Ramadan will start around the 13th of April and will last around 29 to 30 days. Next year, it will start uh, 10 days earlier, around the 3rd of April and so on until it goes round full circle. The implications of that are that so Muslims who are adults, um, and when we say adults, um, this includes teenagers past the age of puberty, and also if they're healthy, then they fast every day in the month of Ramadan for the daylight hours. So at the moment this year, for example, those hours will be between um, 4.30 a.m. That's when they'll set themselves up. They'll have their pre-fast meal and then they will fast without food or drink and also marital relations for those who are married up until sunset, which is going to be around 8.30. They'll do this every day for a whole month. And Ramadan is a very special time for Muslims because it's a very spiritual month. We believe that was a month in which the Quran was revealed. So if you remember, we talked about Prophet Muhammad receiving the revelation. It was actually in the month of Ramadan. Um, and so it's a very special month. We attach ourselves to prayer, to remembrance of God, to reading the Quran more and trying to understand it. And we get together with our family usually um, and break our fast together um, we break our fast also in the mosque and we pray the night prayers in the mosque these are usually much longer prayers that last you know an hour an hour and a half and some people pray even longer than that depending on their um, their willpower so it's a very special month for us and at the end of that month, we celebrate the Eid al-Fitr celebration. And the fifth and final pillar of Islam is the pilgrimage to Mecca. And you can see a picture of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. And this is the, the house of God, we call it. Um, and it is we believe it was built by the prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael. And it was the first house built or the first temple or church or mosque for built for the worship of the one true God. So Muslims who are 
able to afford the journey because it is quite expensive. And if they're healthy, then they have to make that pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime. And they go there and they pray to God and they are there with millions of other Muslims from all over the world, from every corner of the globe, all worshiping the same God, all worshiping for the men, same white pieces of clothing um, during the days of the Hajj, the pilgrimage. And this shows us that we are all equal, rich or poor, black or white. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God and everyone is there together as one brotherhood and sisterhood. And Muslims believe that when they, if they do the pilgrimage correctly without getting angry and committing any sins, then they return home as pure as a newborn baby. So it's a way of erasing one's sins and starting a new chapter in their life. Now looking at Muslims in the UK, and in Wiltshire, according to the last census of 2011, um, which is probably out of date um, by the time we get the results of the new census, but at the moment, this, these are the only figures we have. So we can see that the UK has around 2.8 million Muslims. And that's around 4.8% of the population of England and Wales. In the southwest, there are 51,000 Muslims. In Wiltshire, we're talking about the local authority area, there are 2,000, over 2,000 Muslims. And in Swindon, there are over 3,500 Muslims. Now, 8.1% of all school aged children are Muslim, again, according to the last census, 73% of Muslims state British as their only national identity. 24% of Muslims 16 and over have degree level education and above. Muslims, despite being around 4.8% of the population make up 13% of the prison population, 43% of Muslims own their own property and 28% of Muslims are in social housing. Collectively, Muslims have sp the spending power of 20.5 billion pounds in the UK. And here is a breakdown of Muslims in the UK by ethnicity. Um, and you can see that the vast majority of Muslims are from the Indian subcontinent in the UK. And, but we are also a very diverse community. So in the UK, there are Muslims from all over the world. Um, even in our local communities, you have Muslims from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Morocco, um, Saudi Arabia, other area, other parts of the Middle East, um, from all over Africa, um, Indonesia, Malaysia. We also have Muslims, white English Muslims, um, and African Caribbean Muslims, and so on. So it's a very diverse community here and in other parts of the world. British Muslims are rooted in its history, in the country's history. And the history of Muslims in Britain stretches um, over 1000 years. And in fact, the picture I'm showing you here is of um, a coin that was minted by King Offa of Wessex of, um, from the eighth century. So you can see that even in the eighth century, there was Islamic influence in Britain. 
And this inscription that you see in Arabic on the coin says the Arabic uh, testimony of faith, the Islamic testimony of faith, which is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, which means there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And this, as I mentioned, is the first pillar of Islam. So it's important to know these facts from history to, to show that Islam isn't so alien uh, to this country. And here's a picture of Britain's first purpose-built mosque. And this is in Woking in Surrey and it opened in 1889. So although I mentioned Islamic history does go back um, in Britain, um, it wasn't until the rise of the British Empire did Britain see a deepening relationship with Muslims. The 18th century saw the first large group of Muslims arriving in Britain. The first group of Muslims to arrive in the 18th century were Laskars, sailors, recruited from the Indian subcontinent to work for the British East India Company. Also, it's worth noting that over two and a half million Muslims fought for Britain in World War I, and over five million Muslims fought in World War II. And there's a report by the Muslim Council of Britain, which um, is very interesting if you're interested in finding out more about the Muslim contribution to the war efforts. Now, Muslim communities are spread throughout the British Isles and are represented in all areas of British economic, cultural and political life. And there are Muslims in every aspect of society. So from small businesses to restaurants, from law and accountancy to IT, from the National Health Service to teaching, transport and public services, from politics and the media to sport, art and fashion, Muslims are really making a valuable contribution to Britain's multi-ethnic, multi-faith society. How many of the Muslims in the picture here can you name? So how do we deal with our Muslim colleagues, neighbors, friends, possibly family members? There are a few things to note. Every Muslim, just like anybody else, should be treated as an individual. And it's always worth knowing what the individual's requirements are. So you can't just apply a blanket rule to all Muslims or those you perceive to be Muslims. As I mentioned at the start, commitment to the faith varies from person to person um, and observance. So I've just listed some common things to be aware of. And as I mentioned, you know, it might not apply to everyone who says they're a Muslim, um, but for the most part, it, it will apply. So Muslims don't eat pork and they don't drink alcohol, or not supposed to at least, um, for those who are practicing. So that's a consideration to have, but again, I would always recommend asking the person what their needs are and usually when it comes to functions and dietary requirements, Muslims, if there isn't the halal um, meat option available, then vegetarian is the safest option. And with regards to halal meat as well, most Muslims, again, um, will only eat meat, which is halal. And this is meat which is slaughtered in according to um, the Islamic way with a prayer mentioned over it. 
and it is similar to kosher meat. In fact, Muslims are also allowed to eat kosher meat. Prayer and fasting, as I mentioned, is very important. So it's worth um, knowing that a Muslim you work with or the works for you may need time off for prayer and they may, may need somewhere to pray in the workplace. Although the Equality Act 2010 does not require employers to provide time off for work, a refusal without good reason could amount to indirect discrimination. So it's always worth considering. And as I mentioned, these prayers only take a few minutes. And, um, you know, so for some people that's, you know, a bathroom break or a cigarette break. So Muslims uh, have two main festivals, the Eid al-Fitr, which comes at the end of Ramadan and the Eid al-Adha, which comes a few months later at the end of the pilgrimage season. And usually Muslims like to take time off to go to the mosque and pray, spend time with their family and visit friends and relatives. But the only issue is that we don't usually know the exact date um, well in advance because it depends on the sighting of the new moon. So it's worth considering that we may need to be a bit flexible about allowances for time off. With regards to dress, Muslim men and women are advised in the religion to dress modestly. Um, Muslim women do have specific uh, rules regarding dress and covering and many, and not all, but many Muslim women certainly wear the hijab, the um, which includes the head covering and loose garments. With regards to gender interactions, so Muslims do have some restrictions when it comes to socializing and um, contact between members of the opposite sex. And a great example of respect for colleagues in the workplace comes from none other than the world famous Liverpool Football Club. Now, women in Islam is a very topical subject and there are a lot of misconceptions about Islam's view of women and its treatment of women. In Islam, all men and women are equal before God. All men and women are equal before the law. Women, just like men, have the obligation to seek an education, not just a right, but the obligation, despite what certain countries uh, practice. They also have the right to engage in business, to own a business, to work. And if Muslim women choose to work, they have the right to keep all of their earnings. You see, a man in Islam has to provide for his family. Um, so what belongs to him belongs also to his wife. But a woman, on the other hand, whatever she earns is for her. And she doesn't have to spend a penny on her family. Of course, you know, most people will do, but she's not obligated to. And a man doesn't have the right to ask her for that. Muslim women also had the right to inherit. And this is something that even in this country was not afforded to women up until um, the last 150 years or maybe even less than that. Also, Muslim women have the right to keep their family name and identity even after marriage. So certain cultural practices are often against Islam and not because of it. So there are certain um, cultural practices such as FGM, forced marriages, um, honor killings, 
and these things are against Islam and they're practiced in certain regions of the world and they have nothing to do with religion. So for example, in some places where forced marriages take place, it takes place regardless of the religion, whether a person is Hindu, Muslim, Christian, or Sikh, then so those certain practices exist in those societies. So we should not judge Islam by those actions. In fact, the first person to convert to Islam was a woman, and that was Khadija, Prophet Muhammad's wife. The first martyr in Islam was a woman, the first person to be killed for being a Muslim, and that was a lady called Sumeya. And Prophet Muhammad, he said to his male followers, the best of you are those who are best to their wives, and I am the best to mine. He also, in a famous um, hadith, he said, when a man asked him who deserves his love and care and attention the most, he said, your mother. And then the man again asked the same question, then who? He said, your mother. The man asked the Prophet Muhammad, and then who? Prophet Muhammad again said, your mother. And then a fourth time, the man asked again, and then who? And Prophet Muhammad said, and then your father. So he mentioned the mother three times, three times, and then the father. With regards to the hijab and Muslim women's dress, this is something again, which um, a lot of uh, misconceptions arise and there's a lot of hostility towards it and um, people claim that Muslim women who wear that are oppressed, they're backwards, they're stupid, um, they're being forced to wear it but in fact if you look at the pictures of the Virgin Mary you see that she's covered in also you know in a similar way and if you look at the way nuns dress also Orthodox Jewish women, they dress in a very similar way. And it's not about oppression, it's about the women making a choice and no one can force them. They make a choice, um, those who do wear it, um, because they believe that it is more modest and also it brings them closer to God. And if you look at the picture on the right, you see that the dress and covering for women throughout the world in many different religions are very similar. So why do we have a problem with the way Muslim women, some Muslim women dress and the way they cover? And this relates to the next topic, which is Islamophobia. And most coverage of Muslims in British news outlets has a negative slant according to a major analysis by the Muslim Council of Britain, which concluded that news stories in the mainstream media are contributing to Islamophobia. The study found the Mail on Sunday had the most negative coverage of Islam with 78% of its stories featuring Muslims having negative themes above an already high industry average of 59%. And this brings us to the subject of terrorism in the name of Islam. And in fact, terrorism has no religion. There is no religion that promotes terrorism. And there's an article here that I've referenced from The Guardian in 2015, titled, The Role of Islam in Radicalization is Grossly Overestimated. And here's a quote from the article, the fact is that the role of religion in radicalization and de-radicalization is grossly overestimated. There is actually no empirical evidence to support the claim that religion, brackets, any religion, close brackets, and ideology are the primary motivators of violent extremism. The revelation that wannabe foreign fighters prepared for battle 
by reading copies of Islam for Dummies and the Quran for Dummies underscores this. The point has also been made by some of the world's most renowned scholars of terrorism who agree that other factors play a much larger role. So, Islam unequivocally prohibits indiscriminate bombings such as what happened on 9-11, 7-7 and so on. Prophet Muhammad stressed the prohibition of killing women, children, the elderly and all innocent people even in times of war. So terrorists are misguided and ignorant of Islamic teachings and do not follow the advice of the real scholars of Islam, some of whom are very harsh against extremists and terrorism. And some of them even went as far to say that anyone who claims that terrorism is from Islam is actually uh, not a Muslim. And the Quran clearly states, whoever kills an innocent person, it is as if he has killed all of humanity. So if you look at this circle here, it represents the 1.8 billion Muslims. It says 1.5, but we'll ignore that. And the little dots that you see, this one here represents ISIS. So just a little speck. And this was a while ago. So hopefully, you know, it would be invisible now. And this one here represents the uh, Al Qaeda. So 50,000 or so, 10,000 or so followers of Al Qaeda at the time. And again, hopefully these numbers are very, even much lower now. And there are many studies showing that, again, like the Guardian article previously, that the so-called Islamic terrorism is just a fraction of overall terrorism that occurs. And according to this study between 2006 and 2013, it showed that only 0.7% of terrorist acts were carried out by so-called Muslims. And finally, we find that the greatest threat to the UK is far-right extremism. And more white people have been arrested in the last year suspected of terrorism than any other ethnicity for the third year in a row, the Home Office has said. So concerns about the growth of far-right extremism have grown in recent years, with children as young as 10 being investigated over possible links to the ideology. So what are the causes of extremism? Extremism is caused by a lack of education, sometimes, ignorance of true Islamic teachings, misinterpretation, and not understanding the context of verses of the Quran and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, overzealousness, perceived injustices and taking things into people's own hands, which is wrong, Certain cultural practices, which, as I mentioned, are against Islam. Generational differences. And sometimes poverty and marginalization. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. And I hope you enjoy this very brief introduction to understanding Islam and Muslims. Thank you for listening.